Okay, then I guess we'll call this meeting to order. I'm going to use a gavel for the first time. This is exciting. <laughs> yeah, I want to welcome all of you to the to the meeting. Um, for us old timers, um, we used to have these meetings all every year uh, prior to our JRSA conference, and it was always a wonderful time to be able to get together and network and just catch up because we just don't get to see each other very very often. And um, so I just I really do enjoy the face to face meetings. Um, and hopefully we can continue this next year. Um, the plan is, for those of you who don't already know, um, the NCJ meeting next year will be in Long Beach. And let's just assume that the business meeting will take place afterwards. So just keep that in mind for next year. Um, for those of you who are on the phone or webinar, you know we miss you and we hope that you can be here next year. Um, it's, I'm not going to talk very long. It's, because we're going to hit all of this stuff in the business meeting, but I just want to highlight that it's been a really busy year for JRSA. Um, you know, we implemented, as you know, the strategic plan, and so now, well, we, we uh, revised the strategic plan, and so now we're in the process of implementing it, and that's involved a lot of committee work to achieve the goal. So um, JRSA staff have worked really hard to get the, um, you know, to staff the committees and I think we've made a lot of progress in this in this first full year. And also I also I also want to highlight that in addition to working towards the strategic plan, JRSA staff has done an incredible job the last several months um, writing grants. And uh, I'm assuming they'll hit that briefly in the business meeting, but it is so commendable. They've written like twelve grants in four to six months or something like that. I mean unbelievable. So um, I really commend them for all their efforts. It's just been incredible. Um, today's agenda is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to, after we introduce the new SAC directors, we'll get into various reports, the finance reports, the committee reports. Um, we'll go over the Yearwood Award winners, if you weren't there yesterday for the uh, awards luncheon. Um, we'll hear a little bit about justice research and policy, and we'll get into the new business, and that's about it for, for our business meeting. So um, before I turn it over to George for the new SAC director, uh, to announce the new SAC directors, I just want to thank all of you who have served on committees this past year. I know, you know committee work is, is uh, you know, it's a lot, especially when guys are so busy anyway. So I really do appreciate all the work that you've been doing on committees to, to move JRSA forward. And for those of you who have not served on committees, please consider doing so. Um, it's a great way to meet your fellow SAC colleagues and to start conversations with them, networking, and, and just share information and, and realize how similar you are on the issues that you share. And it's just a great way to really get to know one another. So I highly encourage you, if you have not served on committees, to, to do so in the upcoming year. So that's, uh, that's all I have. And I'm going to turn it over to George now, who is on the phone. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, if we could uh, have the next slide, Jason, possibly. And uh, while Jason's getting that slide up, I just want to echo uh, uh, Lisa's uh, comments about uh, uh, acknowledging all the hard work that the staff has put in and uh, and also just all the co great committee work that we've had this past year. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our new SAC directors. I, While I was down at the conference, I had to leave yesterday afternoon, and I apologize that I'm not there in person. I, uh, um, but I, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting and talking with uh, a, a couple of the new SAC directors. I want to introduce them all now. Uh, from Iowa, we have Kyle Beisner. Uh, from Kentucky, we have Diane Marcus. And um, uh, from Minnesota, Valerie Clark. And from North Dakota, Colleen Wentz. And uh, I, I, since I'm not there, I can't ask them to stand up, but, uh, but I'll spare them that. Um, but I, I, I had the opportunity to talk to uh, uh, for a while with Valerie and Colleen, and I'm sorry I didn't get a chance to really talk much with Kyle or Diane, uh, but uh, I really want to welcome you all, and uh, I want, you to, want to encourage you as much as you feel comfortable to reach out to your fellow SAC directors. Uh, I think we have a really a great network, and uh, I really uh, lean on my uh, colleagues in other states. I've had the pleasure of working on projects uh, outside of uh, these meetings with uh, 
SAC directors and uh, please feel like this is a really, uh, I think, a supportive network. So uh, again, I want to welcome all four of the new SAC directors and um, hope your stay with your respective SACs is a, a really rewarding one. Thank you. Okay, so next. That, uh, oh. <laughs> Sorry, George. Uh, next, we have Angie, who's uh, going to um, just do the minutes of the uh, of the last meeting. Hello, this is Angie. Uh, since the 2015 annual business meeting was conducted as a webinar, the complete audio track and slides were recorded and kept as an accurate historical transcript. And those of you that are interested in reviewing the recording can access it on the uh, using the link that's on the screen that I think you're seeing. And, and next. all right. Okay. okay. Next, um, we have the Doug Yearwood National Publication Awards, and Christine Denman is going to announce those. Each year, JRSA recognizes the outstanding efforts of large and small SACs to apply empirical analysis to criminal justice policymaking. The Douglas Yearwood National Publication Award is given in two categories, statistical management and research and policy analysis. And it is my pleasure to announce this year's winners. Um, for the category Excellence in Statistical Management, the small SAC winner goes to Oregon for their report, Oregon Recidivism Analysis. The large SAC winner is West Virginia, the West Virginia Statistical Analysis Center for their report, Evidence-Based Offender Assessment, a Comparative Analysis of West Virginia and U.S. Risk Scores. In the category, Excellence in Research Policy Analysis, the small SAC winner is Oregon for their report, Short-Term Transitional Leave Program in Oregon. And the large SAC winner is West Virginia for their report, Recidivism, a Direct Sentence uh, Science Released from Dave Report Centers in 2011, Predictors and Patterns Over Time. Please join me in congratulating our winners. Okay, moving on, we have the committee reports, and the first report is of the membership committee. Hello, uh, thank you. I'm uh, Tim McDonough, director of the uh, SAC in Virginia. And um, as was said earlier, we last year developed a strategic plan for GRSA, and one of the topics that we examined was what can we do to improve our membership? And uh, after the discussions of the plan and whatnot, we came up with uh, various things we'd like to do to try and understand our membership and determine what we can do to better serve it. Uh, what we did as part of that background is we uh, we conducted a survey of the current JRSA members, and we also surveyed prior members who were no longer with JRSA to determine why they were no longer with JRSA. Basically, we came to the conclusion that we, we didn't understand and track our membership well enough to really be as responsive as we'd like to be. So um, we did that. We, we asked, uh, again, members why they join, why they leave, uh, individual members as well as SACs and SAC institutions. Uh, and based on what we found, we, we started a couple of initiatives to help us improve our understanding of and our services to members. And uh, just to give you a, a sense of what we've been doing since then and are continuing to do, uh, first of all, we we worked on improving our ability to collect and 
look at information about our membership trends, who's staying, who's leaving, looking at it by category of uh, membership, uh, how it seemed to play out in terms of fee structures and, and how that affected membership. And it, it just gave us more insight into what members were thinking about what their what their sense was of, of what they get from JRSA and what they might want from JRSA. Uh, based based on on that, we again we did a couple things. Um, for example, we we found out in talking to past members that the the biggest single reason that past members were no longer members was not. It's not that they actively left the organization, it's that they just kind of let their membership lapse uh, because the date came and went and they were just so busy doing their everyday work. So one of the things we're doing now is we are uh, we're automatically sending emails to members prior to their membership expiration dates to remind them to sign up, and we're, we're we're hoping that's gonna that's gonna help us because again, that was that was the single biggest reason we we saw in terms of why people left. They just let it lapse. So um, we're doing that. Um, we came up with various ways of allowing more voting participation by members so they felt more invested in in JRSA. Uh, one of the things we, we realized and talked about is the fact that historically JRSA has been very, very focused on the SACs, uh, which kind of fed out of the history of, of the SACs and JRSA. But uh, so we're we're working on expanding the the not only the membership in general beyond the SACs. Uh, trying to bring in more individuals, trying to reach out to groups beyond SAC, such as people that work in other criminal justice agencies and organizations within the states, and also uh, to academic researchers in criminal justice to try and invite them to come in as well. Uh, we're, we're making more of an effort to do that than we have in the past. Uh, we're also allowing the more voting participation membership that we have in the past and but we're still kind of working through how that one's working uh, we're offering targeted membership to uh, membership discounts to to certain people that we like to bring in as, as, as participants and hopefully bring in the first time what will encourage them to stay uh, one of the things that we we discovered in our survey results and then just discussions amongst ourselves and with SACs is that the uh, the communications that they were receiving from JRSA sometimes weren't as effective as they could be. Uh, a lot of it seemed to come down to the fact that most of us in our everyday working world were just barraged with emails and notifications about this, this and that and the other. and, and JRSA has multiple ways to do that, so we've been working since then on streamlining the way that we communicate so our messaging cuts through the clutter and, and it's just more convenient and, and more salient to the people on the receiving end of our emails. Um, one of the other things we're, we're working on is understanding and paying more attention to the fact that there's a lot of variation in our membership. Uh, again, traditionally, the SACs are the target for the services that JRSA provides. And um, we're realizing that among the SACs themselves, there are, there are a lot of differences. A SAC of one is not the same thing as a SAC of seven. Uh, a SAC that is located in a state SAA can be very different from a SAC that's located in a state university. Their 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 needs and 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 what 
what they might be looking for from JRSA can be very different. So we're really working to understand that better and, and, and figure out how we can fine tune what we do. Uh, and then the same goes for, uh, again, the, the, the non-SAC members. What, 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 what are the needs of a, a, a student in a criminal justice program versus uh, a person who might work in a state correctional agency? Um, so we're, we're doing that. Um, and generally, uh, now that we're better able to track membership and we've got some focus on some of these issues that we need to pay attention to, we're, we're just constantly trying to understand and, and, and tweak the way we communicate with members and provide services to members. And since we started doing that, and, and a lot of this is still work in progress, we're, we're, we're slowly coming up, but we, we, we've got a ways to go on this. We have a lot of ideas for how we can grow our membership and it's, you know, it, it's, it's going to be a work in progress and we're constantly tweaking it and I guess one thing I'd like to say is for, for any of the, the folks who are, are in SACs, uh, particularly the new SACs, uh, we would love to hear from you in terms of what are you getting from JRSA, what would you like to get from JRSA, so we can we can keep on improving the service. We're, we're really no better than, than what we're, we're able to do for the people that are our members and that support us. Uh, so I guess that's, uh, in a nutshell, that's it. Uh, any questions? Yes. Okay. Uh, the the question was, uh, given that we're trying to reach out beyond the SACs, is there is there a strategy that we have for having SAC directors reach out to these non-SAC entities within their their state? And um, I, I guess I correct me anyone if I'm wrong. I don't know that we have a defined strategy for that. We've certainly talked about different ways of doing that in that we're encouraging the SACs to identify people in, again, a range of corrections, law enforcement, prosecution, courts, uh, to invite them to join, to, to, to point them to the JRSA website so they can see what, uh, what things are there. And, and again, we're, trying to, by tracking the membership, better understand how we might be able to provide more services to some of those non-traditional members. Uh, you might want to answer that question. I think the only thing I would add to that is I think you touched on exactly how we can do this better. Um, if you can get people to go to the, to the JRSA website, and then subscribe. Um, now that doesn't mean they have to join, but by subscribing, they get into the member database of somebody who's expressed an interest in something that JRSA offers, whether it's the forum, whether it's grant notes, you know, any of the kinds of uh, member benefits that we have. Somebody goes and subscribes, and then they get on the mailing list. Then we do know that they're interested, and we follow up. Um, for example, we've run two pretty successful membership initiatives during the year tied to special issues of, of justice research and policy. So, for example, when the first one came out and was focused on corrections, we did a mass mailing to people in departments of corrections across the United States, and that generated a fair number of new members. We did the same thing when we did the special issue on incident-based reporting. We tried to target people that we knew had expressed an interest in incident-based reporting and said, oh, we've got this issue in our journey.
journal. And by the way, um, you might want to think about uh, this is of interest to you. There's a lot of other stuff in, in JRSA, uh, member benefits that might be of interest. So um, definitely, you know, for all of you who are SACs who have relationships at the state level that we wouldn't know about sitting in Washington, if you can call to the attention of your relationships the value that you find in JRSA and some of the benefits that you get, point them to the website, then they'll get on our radar screen and we can follow up. Um, plus, we have a lot of membership materials that if you contact us and say, I have somebody that I'm approaching trying to encourage them to join JRSA, we'd be happy to send you all the membership material that we have, so a lot of which is already on the website, but we've got some other things that we can, we can forward to you using the handout and paper copies. So, good question. Thank you. Um, next, we have the Relationships Committee. committee. And in place of Roger, we have... Oh, no, I am Roger. You are Roger. Mm -hmm. The purpose of this presentation, I'm Roger Przbilski. Take that, Greg. <laughs> um, okay. A um, couple of pitches on that are common to all of these committees. I think everybody who's going to get up here um, is going to include one way or another in their presentation. If you are interested in any of these committees, please volunteer. Um, we have a particular need on the membership committee, which has been lightly um, populated since its inception, and really is a terribly important uh, committee for the organization to grow our membership. Um, so as a consistent theme for each of these committees, if you see something that looks interesting to you, don't leave this room without saying, I'd like to be on that committee. The other thing is, you'll notice on each of these slides at the bottom, each of these committees has a, um, a committee discussion forum that you have access to. You can go in and kind of eavesdrop on what's going on in each of the committees and kind of look at the discussion that's going on and the, the issues that they're dealing with. For example, if you go to the Relationships Committee website, um, or discussion forum, one of the things that you'll see is we've been busy this year generating a list of all the organizations that we think JRSA would be well served to, be, to have a working relationship, either for purposes of going after grants or for purposes of just developing kind of professional links. Um, it includes everything from um, the, the judiciary staffs in both the House and the Senate in Washington um, where what you guys know is happening in your states is enormously important to them because it's going to wind up on their desk sometime in the near future. And if we can give them advanced warning of issues that are beginning to emerge at the state level, that enables them to be, instead of reactive, once a crisis hits Washington, they can actually be thinking ahead and gathering evidence and thinking about what types of uh, uh, research and information they need to be able to respond appropriately. Um, but we've developed in this committee over the course of the year a very large list, state agencies, professional associations, foundations, all of whom are active in the criminal justice space, where we're now reaching out and kind of prioritizing those, um, those names, those organizations, those individuals, and saying, all right, let's get a prioritized list of who we need to reach out to and begin working that list. Um, Lisa commented on this year with the, with the success that we've had writing proposals. Many of those proposals were successful because we formed relationships with people and approached the funding agency and said, we're in partnership with this other key player in that particular area, and we're working together on this. And that seems to have borne considerable fruit this year, and we look forward to that. Um, working in terms of our success with, with um, applying for grants down the road. But we also are, in this committee, really devoted to the idea of raising the profile of, of JRSA and its members and getting you the recognition that you deserve because you do excellent work, but many of you work in relative isolation. Nobody knows what you do, or very few people know what you do. Fewer people know what you do than should. That's part of the purpose of this committee is to really think about, in conjunction with, for example, the communication and the dissemination committees, 
how to how to make JRSA a household word among people who talk about criminal justice issues. So it's a big project. It's a lot of fun to work on because you know you get to do a lot of brainstorming. But then you know if you're the type of person who likes um, making new friends and creating new relationships. This is the committee you want to be on. Um, you can see right here the members that are on the committee, um, and they've been doing some wonderful work with us, um, and we look forward to continuing that. But again, you know, if this sounds interesting to you, you know, if you're kind of interested in outreach, and to use a phrase that I heard from many of my staff when I first came on board, and I said, so what's your aspiration? What would you like to happen? They said, I'd like to feel relevant again. Okay. I'd like to feel relevant. How many of you feel that way? Where you feel in your own work, you feel like you'd like to be more influential. You'd like to have, you know, you'd like people to know who you are and the good work you do. That's relationships work. Right? And we're working very hard on that. <clears throat> These are some of our goals, as you can see. And some you can see in the in, in many of these goals they overlap and inter and intertwine. So for example, the first one, fostering relationships, that's going to have payoff in terms of uh, membership. Okay, this is kind of building the networks of relationships that will grow our membership, and by growing our membership, grow our influence. Um, forming collaborations um, and looking to build relationships at all levels of government, whether they're local, state, or federal. Okay. So again, if this is something that sounds interesting to you, let us know and we'll put you on the committee. You don't have to be elected to it. You don't have to be appointed to it. You put yourself on it. So kind of keep your eye on these descriptions and find a place where you want to contribute to your organization. Thank you, Jeff. And next, we have the research committee, and the Alan Wedd will be presenting. Thank you uh, very much. Thanks for having me here today. Um, I should clarify that I am Alan Wedd, not Stephanie Lopez Howard, the co chair. <laughs> people that are on the webinar, perhaps the people in the back of the room there. Um, the, charge of the, <laughs> the charge of the research committee, our goal. Uh, it's to develop a research agenda that's going to promote the use of research in criminal justice and juvenile justice policy and planning. Uh, you can see our numbers up there. It looks like we have a fair amount, though we have had some lag in participation recently. And one of the things that we'd like to do moving forward is encourage people to join. Um, I know people from SACS are going to be heavily involved in research, and um, we really appreciate it if you would consider joining the committee and perhaps leveraging some of your experience into helping us out and, and helping out JRSA. <clears throat> in particular, I'd like to thank uh, George Shaler um, for serving as the Executive Committee Liaison, as well as Stan and Aaron um, from JRSA for participating. It's been uh, extremely valuable to have their support on the Research Committee. And so you can see the, uh, the goals that we work towards on the Research Committee there um, that came out of the strategic plan. Um, broadly speaking, I'm just going to go really sort of very generally here. Um, it's also a plan for seeking funding um, and other supports. Uh, identifying research priorities for the association and uh, developing strategies to include multiple SACs and research projects. Um, one of the things that we did sort of at the beginning of this year was we sent a survey out to the SACs to, to sort of get a little bit more information. We wanted to learn more about um, resources that they have available to them, um, data sets that they're able to access, um, barriers to research, problems that they encounter. Um, if there was interest in collaborating with other SACs on a project, we wanted to know that. And so um, thank you to everybody who participated in that survey. I think we had about 40 stacks who will respond to that. And we tried to use the information from that survey to sort of um, work towards these goals. Um, because you can see there's some, there's some overlap here. Maybe we could get SACs involved. What we were thinking is we could get SACs involved on a collaborative project that maybe had um, where there was mutual interest among some of the states. And then based on that, we could go out and seek funding. Um, unfortunately, though, Many SACs indicated that they were interested in participating, but uh, we just couldn't find a common topic. Um, we've had a lot of discussion on the committee about how to include SACs um, consistent with the third goal that you see up there. Um, it's one of the recommendations for this committee that we, we consider that, um, or perhaps reconsider that, or consider how to maybe go about that a little bit better. Um, because in our discussions, we found that there are a couple obstacles to that. Um, for, 
example, a lot of SACs have different priorities that don't always align with the priorities of other SACs or don't always align with uh, federal funding initiatives. So it can be really difficult to find uh, commonality among the SACs. Um, additionally, a lot of SACs are hard money funded, so they don't really need to um, try to go out and um, hustle and get um, grants on a regular basis. And so there's maybe not that incentive there. And for the SACs that do want to get grants, they might have other local partners that they want to work with. So. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to think about maybe how we can better include some of the SACs in research projects. Um, one potential avenue might be to, um, to uh, encourage them to be middlemen for, for larger JRSA projects. If the chair is trying to do a large national multi-state study, um, perhaps SACs can leverage their relationships that they have within their states as a means of um, attaining data or creating relationships that will help facilitate those research projects. Um, we can also encourage SACs to, um, to apply for funding um, and maybe collaborate with JRSA. You know, one of the sort of common things we saw from the survey is that SACs have a lot of things that they'd like to work on, but either due to time or money or just for a lack of resources in general, they weren't able to do everything. And I'm sure everybody in this room has a project that you'd like to work on, but um, you just don't have the time or the resources to be able to do it. Um, perhaps having JRSA partner with those SACs in terms of grant writing or something like that might be a way um, to help the SACs conduct a little bit more research. Um, I think moving forward, the big priority for the committee is going to be um, to identify research priorities for the association. One of the things um, about JRSA is that it's sort of uniquely positioned to hear from all the different states and to hear about issues that are going on and be proactive rather than reactive, as, uh, as Jeff mentioned earlier there. Um, and so I think. That's what we're mostly going to be trying to work on here moving forward. Um, as I said, you know, because we did the survey to see if there's a common topic we can maybe all collaborate on. That didn't really seem to, to fall out of it. But um, what the research committee can do moving forward is look at some of those grants that are coming out and identifying priorities that are maybe common to multiple grants or seeing just in general um, what are priority funding areas for those different grants. And then maybe we can use that to help identify research priorities. Um, the big one, though, is going to be to to look at what SACs are doing though and try to use that information sort of on a federal level, right? To, um, to let people know um, this is what we might want to prioritize in terms of research here. Um, there's also been some discussion about collaborating um, with some of the other committees, in particular the training and technical capacity committee uh, on the survey so we can learn more about those research priorities. Um, and also doing things like maybe posting a brown bag too, where um, we've been having those on Friday and uh, perhaps SACs can get together and discuss some of the things that they're working on. Um, maybe that will be another productive avenue for us. In terms of that last chart, uh, development plan for seeking funding and other supports. This is uh, another area where the research committee can help out. As it's been mentioned, um, there's been a lot of grant writing going on by JRSA. Um, if the research committee can do work to maybe help um, identify grant solicitations that are coming out, that type of thing, that might be um, a very useful resource that we can provide to JRSA. Um, also, maybe providing suggestions in terms of um, you know, maybe um, which you might want to work on. Um, one other thing that we know now, having done the survey and having planned to conduct the survey coming up here soon, um, is you know what SAC research priorities are. And if we're able to review some of the grant solicitations that are coming out so we can understand sort of what the priority funding areas, uh, we'll know sort of what areas aren't really being funded. And then those areas might be good candidates for reaching out to foundations as a means of, of providing grant funding for research projects. So um, those are some of the things that we're working on. Um, again, I'd like to encourage people to join the research committee. Um, I know many people have a research background and they enjoy research. And uh, it's been really enjoyable. Personally, I've been on it for about six months here. And uh, yeah, I'd like to encourage everybody to join. Join, And uh, thank you for your time. Are there any questions before I go? Okay, next we have the Technical Assistance and Capacity Building Committee, and we have Connie Kostelak. Good morning. <clears throat> See if I can not lose my voice here this morning. It's been a lot of days of talking. I don't know if you're in the same position. Uh, I'm Connie Kostelak. I'm the director of the SAC in Wisconsin, and I co-chair the committee with Lisa Sampson, and hopefully Lisa's still on the phone in case I forget anything. She can jump in. Um, since we have the largest committee name, we've been calling ourselves the TACB, just to make sure if you hear that, uh, you may have seen us at lunch with little signs the other day. We tried to all meet in person so we could get to know each other a little bit. Um, but this, I think, is a really, uh, all the committees are really important. 
Uh, this one I see is almost crossing over into the other committees because what we're really trying to look at is where are we as staff? And as Jeff said, if we're trying to make ourselves more relevant, I think part of that is also building our capacity and, and building really what we have in terms of our fundamental skills, the products that we're producing, the things that we're getting out there are going to help to get us more attention, more money, more recognition, all the things that I think we're all working towards. So we can see the committee members, um, and I really do want to thank both the committee members. Um, Angie from Oklahoma has been our uh, executive committee liaison, and Stan and Aaron have been fantastic. Jason's been helping out on things. So we've really had a pretty um, great group working on trying to make sure we have a good handle on where SACs are now, as well as, as well as what we can do as an association to help increase that capacity. Uh, just to get a sense, how many of you in the room did apply for an SJS grant this year? And one of the things you know is that uh, capacity building is one of the areas that we can apply under, right? Uh, so it's important to recognize that from a funding perspective, BJS is looking at where are we in terms of our, of our capacity and what we, can we do to continue to increase that capacity going forward. So this is a really relevant topic for us to talk about. So if you um, look at our strategic goals, we've really been kind of systematically working through our goals. And what we've done, hopefully a lot of you saw the survey that we put out a number of months ago. Um, we really started by taking a look within the committee at what we thought were the most important fundamental skills for a SAC to have. And one of the things we found right away, which was mentioned earlier, is there's a huge variety across the SACs in terms of what they do, where they're situated, the skills of their staff, their ability to hire people, all of those things really do vary. But at the same time, there's some fundamental things that I think we all recognize we need to be able to do, right? We need to be able to analyze data, we need to be able to conduct research, we need to understand statistics. But we also had some other areas emerge from that that I think are newer areas that we're all grappling with. So things like, what are we doing in terms of data visualization? What are we doing in terms of being able to leverage kind of higher level statistics than if not something we do on a regular basis? We need those skills for particular projects or we need to be able to get at those skills when we have particular projects that we're trying to do. So what we did is we went through and we worked as a committee to try to really look at what those key areas are and then try to prioritize them and figure out, we kind of had a color-coded system of what was really, really high in terms of value and what was, you know, these are things you probably can get from other resources, things that you probably could get through your own staff. Um, and then through that, we then did a survey, so hopefully many of you participated in that. But we were trying to get a sense of, here's the things that we thought were important. Where do the SACs see themselves currently on a lot of these areas? Um, so we looked at the preliminary results of that, and many thanks to Erin for spending lots of time. We did go back out and kind of do a second push to get more responses on that survey. Uh, but the survey itself is really valuable, and it's kind of a, an initial check on where we think the SACs are today. And recognizing as you have staff turnover, as you have other things occur, that that can change over time. But if we're trying to say, here's the areas that are most important, but here's the areas where the SACs feel like they really need the help, that's an important part of prioritizing where we're going to be spending our time. So that information together is now going into what we are calling our plan in terms of areas to help build uh, really the capacity building part of this committee. So you will be seeing more on that in the next couple of months as we put that plan together. And part of that is figuring out based on those priorities, what's the best delivery method to try to get those resources out to SACs. So in some cases it may be, you know, here's a couple of sheets of references for other resources that already exist. In other cases, maybe actually courses, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, courses that you may be able to take. You've already seen some of the webinars coming out from JRSA. That's part of this as well. Um, and looking at a variety of ways to make sure that we're hitting those really important areas and getting those resources out to SAC. So as a collective group, we can build our capacity and continue to make our association and our members and all the individual SACs stronger. So um, the one area that I would say that we send where it is on the list, but that we've been probably struggling with the most. Nope, back here. One of the things that um, we were charged with is also trying to figure out kind of what's the baseline expectation in terms of uh, the areas where uh, we expect SACs to be at. And what we've really talked about is let's identify what we all need to be able to do, let's look at what's most important, and then let's try to raise those expectations in terms of what we're all capable of doing. It's really hard to say this is exactly the level that you should be at now you've achieved it. It's more how can we continue to build from where we are today. 
So um, a couple things that I want to just make sure that I mention. Um, if you are on the phone, I apologize because I'm showing something visual at the moment, but hopefully you stopped at the JRSA booth and got copies of these documents. Um, but one of the documents that you have, so in addition to looking at really what can we do to build the capacity of the SAC, the other thing that we've been focusing on is kind of reinvigorating the idea that you can get technical assistance as well. And I don't know about the rest of you, but until I was on this committee, I didn't realize how much capacity we have within the SACs and within the SACs working with JRSA to get technical assistance on particular projects. So I know for us, we haven't taken advantage of it yet, but we will be. Um, so there's a flyer that uh, was put together with the committee and with um, the JRSA staff to try to kind of re-advertise the fact that this technical assistance is out there and repackage it in terms of what the focus is. So you should have a copy of that. Uh, but keep in mind, it's really, it can be really operational. So if you have a project that you're working on, um, or if you're turning in a SAC grant, or you have uh, a paper that you're finishing that you really would like somebody else to take a look at, that can be very direct technical assistance. Maybe it'll come from another SAC. Maybe it'll come from JRSA. In some cases, maybe it'll be a combination. Um, there could also be more direct training and technical assistance if you're working on a specific project and really need some data help or need some guidance or some methodology discussion at least across a couple of people, that those resources are available. So keep that in mind and we are trying to re-advertise that and also think about ways to get that out in front of the SAC at appropriate times. If we all get really busy, we forget about those resources. So if we can get it out in front of you at times where it's going to be most important, then hopefully you'll take advantage of those resources as well. Um, the other things that you have, this is very exciting, the blue and orange document that you have. So one of the other things that's occurring, which um, is tied into the TACB committee and is really, I think, a, a huge step in terms of the capability of getting information uh, and really hands-on kinds of um, training out to the facts is JRSA now has a program called iCohere, which is essentially a course management, online course management system. And this is the first course, and somebody jump in and correct me if I'm wrong, <laughs> this is the first course uh, being put out under iCohere. But part of the goal of this is to have you at least log in and see what the system is all about to help us determine how this can be best utilized as we move forward with trying to build capacity. So if any of you have ever taken online courses, this is essentially what the kind of tool that's used for course management. And the other thing that's really great about this is we may be able to get this out to others, right? As we move forward, we just talked about reaching out to other state partners, other agencies. This may not be something that we need to necessarily limit or maybe we pull other people in as JRSA members. That there's a really new benefit in terms of having specific courses that you can take in an online fashion. Um, probably in a more targeted way than you would if you do like a, a big MOOC, like a massive online open course. Uh, these are more targeted, right? And they're trying to fit the needs of the SACs and fit, fit the research needs that are going on in the state. So take a look at this and this would be important feedback to get to uh, JRSA as well on this. Uh, then you also have another handout related to ISAR. And many of you hopefully know what ISAR is, but there is an effort underway to uh, simplify this process and make it more useful in terms of being able to both put your information in and get information back out. So JRSA is looking for help and Sean is looking for help and, <laughs> and information on that as well. Um, and it obviously ties in really to all the committees. So I think we just wanted to make sure we mentioned that. Um, and then the last one, which I think does cross multiple committees as well, is the uh, SAC and student research kind of collaborative effort. Uh, if any of you have ever had student researchers work with you, you know that you both really benefit because they get skills and the experience of working with data, and you often get analysis done for cheap or really or for free in some cases. So take a look at all of those. Those are all part of how can we leverage the resources that are out there to make sure we continue to build the strengths of the SAC um, and that we are moving forward collectively in our skills and our abilities to, to really put out solid products that impact policy and impact what's going on in in our states and across the nation. So, any questions for me? Lisa, did I forget anything? Um, you did an incredible job, and it's been a joy to work with our uh, committee. Um, everyone's been really involved, and I just, the only thing I would just add is, um, I'm sure we're going to get out any handouts that, that people didn't get the opportunity to, to get who are sort of back sitting at their desks. And the other thing is that we're really encouraging, we're a fairly small group, and we have a lot of tasks and a lot of responsibilities on our plate, so we'd love to get additional 
um, members who would be interested in sort of playing a role in, in uh, their own development. So um, hopefully we will get some interested uh, participants. <laughs> so one other, thanks for that, Lisa. So that was our membership drive. Uh, the one other thing that we didn't mention is that as part of the survey, we also asked for um, essentially people that are within the SACs currently that have the capability of teaching in some of these areas that would be willing to share their skills. So we do have a list of people that volunteered. We're always going to be willing to take more. So if you didn't respond or didn't uh, maybe think it was a good fit for you at the time, uh, please do reach out and let us know if there's areas that you think you could cover. We're talking about everything from program evaluation to basic to high-level stats to data visualization. So if you've got some skills or your staff have skills, please send them our way so we can try to leverage the resources we have within the association to help make us all stronger. Excuse me, this is Sandy. None of us can hear the conversation. Thanks, so let Sandy. Me, let me repeat a little bit um, what was just said. So essentially, the um, I think if they're in the audience, unfortunately, uh, you can't hear what's being discussed. But the question was really how to get involved in uh, the student research collaboration. And it sounds like there's multiple ways that that could occur. Um, it can occur by reaching out on your own, by going through JRSA, by working with others. Um, there's a pilot right now in Maine um, for a student who's working on survival analysis, and the goal is to come back and actually have both a product from that, but then also a webinar to talk about the analysis and the techniques that were used and um, more capacity and capability within Maine to then use that type of tool moving forward. So this one's the first example, um, but there is the potential to reach out through organizations such as the American Society of Criminology or other places where we might be able to connect with students to get them hooked up with SACs to be able to work on these types of projects. One other comment, and we do actually have a list of the 25 top graduate programs in criminology in the United States that I can share with you. If you're interested and you're trying to find a student, I'd be happy to send that to you it's on the list. It's not just the departments, but I've also got the department chairman and the graduate placement director for each of those institutions. So it's a, you know, if you're look, understand, you know, as you all well know, if you're a graduate student in criminology, you're looking for data sets and you're looking for a dissertation topic, right? So students are kind of looking for you and we're doing the, you know, reaching out in multiple ways, trying to make it easy for you to find the students that are looking for things that you have, that have skills that you might want to use to get projects done that you currently can't get done with the, with the staffing that you have. So this is in, in its first iteration, but it seems to be going very well, and we're getting a lot of expressions of interest in it from both SACs and from graduate programs and from students. So I think this is a tremendous opportunity for us to kind of Build the you know build the profession and you know it's in your interest because at some point the student that's working on your project 
may very well be an applicant for a job in your SAC. So, you know, it's a, a good way to kind of build the resources that are available to us to get our, the work done that we need to get done. And for those of you on the phone, too, if you didn't hear it, um, Jason did say that these documents will be sent out or made available electronically as well so that you can have what we were just talking about. So, any other questions for TACD? Thank you very much. Thanks, Connie. Um, next, we have the dissemination committee. Hello, I'm Jason Trask. I guess I will uh, give you a brief brief rundown of what we're doing since uh, Brad cannot make it. But uh, you see the goal of our committee there. We're trying to we're trying to figure out like what is the best way to disseminate the information we have. We we have a lot of different people telling us different things about how they like to do that stuff, what works for them, and what doesn't. So we're really trying to figure out. It's kind of a two part thing. Well, what do we have to disseminate? What and then. Once we figure out all that, how, how do people want to get it? We've met a couple times, and I, I, I have to say we're uh, we're working through it. We haven't come up with a, a bunch of answers yet. I think a lot of this is tied to just these committees are interrelated as far as communications and dissemination and everything else, but kind of trying to work through it and figure it all out. You can see our committee members there, and we're happy to have you help if you have some expertise in this uh, area. And, that's about all we have for that today. Let me add a couple of, of just thoughts on that because it is, this is probably the perennial question that we're dealing with right now as everybody goes, what's the difference between the dissemination committee and the communication committee? Um, and actually you can add in the relationships committee and the membership committee because they are all interrelated as they should be as part of an overall strategic plan. I think the, the issue with the dissemination committee is that we started working on the strategic plan um, one of the things that we heard from our members is um, they hated blast emails. They hated emails with, e with PDF attachments. Um, people said, I'm getting 250 emails a day, and quite frankly, I just don't read most of them, right? And we've been monitoring um, email, you know, our email um, that we send out, and we're able to track who opens them. And if it contains a link, who actually clicks on the link? And if it's got to download, how many people download the material? And so one of the things that we're looking at, because we get those metrics, is we're going, yeah, you're right. You are overwhelmed, and you're not opening our emails. So we're sending out information and sitting there in Washington thinking, how come they don't respond? And they're out there in the field, and they're deleting emails because they're getting too many. So one of the things that we're trying to get this committee to think through is, What's the best way to get the information to you that you need? What's the best form? Okay. Is it a, is it an, a simple email? Is it an email with a PDF attachment? Is it um, a tweet that drives you to the website where you can find things? Is it um, a phone call? How do you, how is it we should be talking to you? Now where this gets really kind of interesting is all of you don't like, all of you don't have the same needs. And all of you don't have the same preferences in how we communicate. So it gets into kind of thinking about, well, who is the audience we're trying to talk to? What specific piece of information is it that they need? And what is the best form to get that information to them? And the example I always use for personal experience is you do not write a research article and hand it to a Hill staff member. Just they will not read past the first page. Right? So if the key thing that you're trying to communicate to them is not on the first page, and in most cases, in the first paragraph, they're not going to see it. Okay, So this is a matter of kind of knowing your audience, knowing your needs, figuring out how to meet their need in a way that makes it easy for them to assimilate that information. And, you know, when I came on board as, as your executive director, we had, I think, I think we had nine distinct publications of JRSA that we were putting out with a staff of five and a half people. And my first thought is, oh my Lord, how do we do this? Okay. And then my second thought was, well, it might make sense to have this many publications if in fact they each served a distinct purpose for a distinct audience and they took a 
particular form that was suited to the audience and the need, right? And that's really what the dissemination committee is trying to think through. Who are we talking to? What do they need? What's the best way to get that information to them in a timely manner, in a way that they can digest easily, right? So it doesn't go in an email. It gets lost in the clutter of the other 249 emails they get that day. And they simply delete it because they don't have time to read it. So if you're kind of interested, and this, this can be a fascinating committee because it really gets down in the weeds of who are we, what do we want to know, how do we best disseminate that information. Right? And by the way, this affects not just our members, but people we would like to be our members, or people that we would like to have a relationship with, or people who would profit from knowing what you guys know. Right? So this is a pretty this is a pretty important committee, and I'd really encourage any of you if you're kind of interested in on how to communicate quantitative information to people in a way they can understand. This would be a great committee for you to join. Right? Because it, it is going to be very important for this organization going forward as we begin to kind of broaden our base and try to increase the amount of information that we put out and call more attention to the network of SACs and researchers at the state level who actually know what they're talking about. Right? I mean, let's face it, one of the interesting things about the time we live in, we live in an era where people make decisions based on narrative and sometimes anecdote, but not very often on facts and evidence. But that's our business, right? So we got to get better at that. And so it, that, that's what this committee is really all about. So again, if you're interested in thinking through those kinds of complex issues, and these are going to overlap with membership and relationships and communication and technical assistance and capacity building and they're going to overlap with research because all of those things produce information that's of value. How do we get that out to people so that they realize that it's available to them and they're able to use it? This is the committee you want to be on. Uh, thanks, Jason and Jeff. And we're going to move on next to the communication committee. Good morning, everyone. This this is Ellen McCann. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Um, thank you all for having me join you today, WebEx and fun. Um, and to kind of ride the coattails of what the guys were just saying about the dissemination committee, I think that one of the things that the communications committee, <clears throat> excuse me, has been trying to find our niche for is in the same conversation. Jeff did a really great job of kind of helping us see those, um, the, the, the collaboration that needs to occur between these committees, and I think it's something that all the committees can, and can take a, a page out of. So thank you, Jeff, for helping us along the way here. But what he's basically shown us is this continuum where we have the relationships folks who are figuring out who we should and have relationships with, the communications committee to look at that list saying, okay, and how's the best way to approach those folks and then what should our message be to make sure they hear it because of whom they are? And finally, dissemination so that it gets out. And so we've spent a lot of time kind of intercommunicating with different committees. Um, for example, Roger was incredibly helpful to us talking about relationships committee to try and figure out, you know, we do overlap and we should, as Jeff points out. And so we have... Um, just to give that membership plug, we have the smallest list of members, so anyone who's interested in being part of our conversation, we would love to have you join us. Um, and we've had a, a very small and efficient group, but um, we can always use more. We can use more from the SAC side always, uh, because I think that it helps us get a better feel for what our state actors are up to. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but uh, on the next slide, you see we have some strategic goals, and our members, um, Henry, Kristen, Ted, Heather, and Janina, and obviously myself, Jeff and Jason have been incredibly helpful in trying to lay out a very task-oriented way to get to these goals. Um, and I think that every committee functions kind of in their own way in trying to get to the end game here. And so for us, it's been a very task-oriented group 
And so what we did was, for the three strategic goals, we had everybody volunteer for which one they wanted to work on so that everyone would have a little bit of a say in where they were headed. And so we have two committee members working on the first one. And that first goal, obviously, it says it right there on the screen, is to in identify innovative and sound approaches um, to heighten awareness. So what we did was we identified the two community, community members. We head up this goal, and we set out what the goal means with the help of Jeff and, as I mentioned, Roger. And we've set out some basic goals and timelines for reaching them. Um, I'm an Excel person, so I've got it all on a big Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> and we, um, we include thinking about current and additional relationships that Roger was able to share with us, with organizations, sponsors, nonprofits, um, and how we should best engage them, both the new ones and the ones we want to sustain. Um, and so our group, the, the first goal group, is setting out ways that are the best approaches for those types of partner organizations and individuals. The second strategic goal, identify and assess the adequacy. Uh, we have identified three committee members working on this goal. They're in the midst of planning out some goals and timelines, looking at how usable, digestible, and timely the JRSA provided information is, and how we can best consider the audiences that the first group is looking at in packaging information and formatting research projects. Uh, and finally, our third strategic goal, reviewing the website, uh, systematic plans for development and enhancement through the lens of the membership, partners, and customers. Um, this group is, is, is four folks, and they've already begun looking at more dynamic rather than static repositories of information, not just a place where folks can go and pull documents they want, but a place where, and one of our members stated it very well, a place where you go to do your work. Because if you want to use data and research and information, you shouldn't want to just go and pull down those PDFs that can be attached to an email that Jeff was talking about. And so we, and this is the theme that attaches to the dissemination committee. So once our goals are met here and laid out, um, we're going to be working with the dissemination committee to make sure that we, we are seamless there. Um, and that group has actually done a great job setting out some metrics and goals to measure success of that particular strategic goal. So um, folks have been very energized around this. It's been a quiet summer, I think, for everyone because of conferences and work um, and everything that seems to uh, come to a peak in the summers. But we are definitely looking at trying to meet some of our goals in the next few months. Um, but again, plug, plug, plug for more members because we can always use more brain power to try and figure out how to best reach the folks that the committees want to reach and the membership wants to include. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Ellen. Yeah. Um, any questions? Okay. Uh, moving on, we are now going to get an update on justice research and policy. Can everyone hear me? Yes, David, we can. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so, uh, with uh, justice research and policy, we've gotten out two editions of the journal under the new arrangement with SAGE uh, publications. Uh, one was on uh, corrections issues that was mentioned uh, earlier in the meeting, a special issue that was guest edited by Alan Beck. Um, the other one was a special issue on NIBRS, which was guest edited by uh, Lynn Addington. Um, so those were the two special issues that came out. One came out uh, early in 2016. We've gotten the submission website up with SAGE, so that, that process is working well. Um, one of the advantages that we realized in going with SAGE is they have a process for web-based submissions and web-based reviews that I think makes the system a little bit more efficient. Um, right now, we're in the process of finalizing the article selection for the next issue, so we're hoping to have the, the next batch of articles that will be published uh, identified and to SAGE by the end of this month, um, and then we'll be working on, on reviewing and soliciting more articles for the next issue. Um, 
one of the biggest challenges we faced is is getting a large enough number of submissions. So we we've gotten a fair number, but we would obviously like a lot more so that we can uh, get out multiple issues a year. Um, so something to encourage your staff to consider is um, if they're working on research that perhaps uses a technique or a methodology uh, that's that's sophisticated and, and is getting it hypothesis testing that would be appropriate for a journal, but might be too technical uh, for the audience that you're trying to communicate with, perhaps uh, submitting something to justice research and policy would be um, an option for them to consider. Uh, this fall, what we're going to try to do is uh, repeat our efforts that we had went through last year, and that's to try to simulate some interest in submissions to the journal. We sent out uh, one of the 250 emails that people get about the journal, but we also sent it out to other practitioner uh, researchers that were aware of people in academia trying to stimulate some, some submissions, and also working through our editorial board, which includes representation from the SACs, but also uh, the academic community. So, um, so that's kind of where we're at. Um, we're also working with SAGE to see what efforts they can provide in terms of increased advertisement of the journal and trying to increase submissions to the journal from uh, non sac members. Um, so that's something we're also working on. Okay, thank you, Dave. Um, now we're going to move on to the results of the 2016 election of officers. So, Sue, do you want to come up? I love that picture. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it's great seeing everybody out here. This is so fantastic to actually have everybody in the room again. I know that's not what I'm talking about, but it's, it is good to see faces. I would like to have them all introduce themselves, but that's not my job. <laughs> Sorry, it comes with the gray hair. Um, but importantly, they, we did have an election, and we had a uh, committee that was appointed by Lisa, the president, um, that was um, made up of uh, Janina Wayne uh, from Idaho, he used to be a SAC director. Um, now she's moved on to correction, and uh, Megan um, from Illinois. So they were hardworking, uh, both of them, and we were led, really, I'm the chair in name, but uh, Sandy Dayton steered us through, so we appreciated her uh, considerably. All right, without further ado, here is your executive committee. Um, a lot of familiar faces and at least one new. For president, Lisa Cho. And for vice president, I feel there should be a drum roll or something. <laughs> George Taylor, who's on the phone from the main class. Yay, George. Congratulations. For secretary treasurer. We have Jeanette Vyskovic, who uh, was with the um, Minnesota SAC and is now with Hennepin County, DOC. Um, Jeanette, are you there? No? But congratulations to her nonetheless. Um, and then we have the elected delegates. And this year, we have Roger Pravelski, which most of us know from the RKC group and used to be the Illinois SAC director. So, um, and here's our new person, Matt Belisky from the Arizona SAC, and he's here in the room. Matt, I told him we would do an initiation, but. <laughs> I only I only let him sweat it one day. <laughs> and last but by no means least, uh, Jim McDonough at the uh, Virginia SAC, who is also. Oh, 
there they all are. Oh, and of course, Stephen Haas, uh, who is the past president and the uh, past uh, West Virginia SAC, who uh, won two awards yesterday, uh, will remain on the board. So that's our distinguished 2016-2017 executive committee. Um, one of the pleasures of being an association, association president is having the opportunity at the end of the term to thank those who have volunteered their time to serve um, the association's members. And in this case, I want to recognize the service of our members of the 2015-2016 Executive Committee. Um, service on the Executive Committee is always demanding, but especially so this year. We've had been dealing with some critical issues, including implementing the strategic plan, and it's really involved a lot of committee work and expanded roles of committees. Um, and our executive committee has been serving as liaisons on those committees, which has been a, it's been a lot, um, a lot of work for them. And they've also been working to um, put in place many of the changes of the association's bylaws and election policies and procedures that are. Um, that now align better with our strategic plan. Um, these were all major tasks, but they were also major steps forward for JRSA. So they, they've been, in addition, just been part of a fundamentally changing the way that the executive committee does its business, um, transitioning from just passively receiving activity reports to um, creating a vision for the association and then monitoring progress towards its achievement through serving as those liaisons. It would be an understatement to say that none of this could have happened without their commitment and, and involvement. So on behalf of the executive committee members, the staff of JRSA, and all of our members, please accept our heartfelt thanks for your service for this year. So thank you. Thanks, folks. Are there any questions, any new business to discuss? Okay. Well, let's, let's quickly. <laughs> well, well, why don't we go ahead and quickly do that, and then we'll conclude the business meeting. So, let's start. Sorry to be a bother. We can't hear anything on the phone. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to repeat it. So we've already heard from Aaron Farley, JRSA staff, and Sean Flower, JRSA staff. Caleb McConnell from the Maryland SAC and Greg Costa. Okay, great. You, you could tell from the smile she's the one that won the award. You know, the, Kelly's very happy today. Is everyone just introducing themselves? Yes, everybody's introducing themselves. Okay. And unfortunately, the handheld mic doesn't work. Uh, you know what we could do is we could make him come up here and introduce himself. Oh, and gosh. Uh-oh, we've got a rebellion in the audience. They're, they're unwilling to come up and speak into the microphone at the podium. So we're just going around the room and everybody's introducing themselves so people can match names to faces. Manone Butler from the DC SAC. Marjorie Stanick from Kentucky. Agate Alderton of the Illinois SAC. Sam Gonzalez from Georgia SAC. Misty Kuiper from the Idaho SAC. And Lloyd Phelps also from the Idaho SAC. And Janina Wing from the Idaho Department of Corrections, formerly from the Idaho SAC. That's why they're all sitting together. Okay. George Brown from the Kansas SAC. 
Carlina Orozco from the Arizona SAC. Okay. Ah, uh, Luke Bung Fu from the Kansas SAC. Right, okay. Oh, Opal. Opal West from the Louisiana SAC. Welcome. Eric Shoup from the Wisconsin SAC. And we will correct the spelling on the slide. Your name. I'm sorry. Autocorrect kills me. Jackie Vandercook from the Tennessee SAC. Matt Valeski of the Arizona SAC. Stephanie Lopez Howard from the Georgia SAC. Right. That would be Stan Orchowski in case you didn't catch all of that there. And say, okay, the rest of you. Oh, no, come on. Get him to do it. One more time. Uh, Alan Leck from the Ohio, Ohio SAC. Uh, Jim McDonough from the Virginia SAC. Jeff Sedgwick, JRSA. Lisa Schell from the Ohio SAC. Connie Kostelak, Wisconsin SAC. And Christine Denman from the New Mexico SAC. <clears throat> And I'm Jason Trask from Jarrison. The last one. All right. Who's out there on phone? You need to introduce yourself now. Angie Baker, Oklahoma. Sorry. Angie Baker from Oklahoma. George Shaler from the state of Maine. Okay, George from Maine. Lisa Sampson from Massachusetts. Lisa Sampson from Massachusetts, good. Ellen McCann from D.C. Ellen McCann, D.C. Uh, SAC. Stephen Haas, uh, formerly from West Virginia. <laughs> Stephen from, formerly from West Virginia, yep. now from D.C. Yeah. Sandy Dayton from JRSA. Sandy Dayton, your finance director from JRSA. Anyone else? Dave Olson from Loyola, formerly with the Illinois SAC. Great, David, thank you. All right, hearing none others. Are there any questions, comments? If not, Madam President, you may gavel us to a close. Okay. I guess this concludes our 2016 annual business meeting. Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> Bye, so everybody. Thanks, folks. <laughs> Wait a minute. That's not Sandy signing off, is it? Um, the question was, is there no finance report? No, there is not. Um, and let me explain why. Um, I'll keep it short. Right? Yeah. No. Um, but quite frankly, um, because of the time, normally at a, you know, at, were we holding the annual business meeting where, when we held it last year, like in November, we would already know officially um, what results were of our grant proposals that were submitted. So we would actually be in a position to do two things. And some of you may remember this from last year. Um, we actually had the audit report, so that the, we had the audit finished for the preceding year, which for us fiscally, for our audit purposes, our year runs from July 1st to June 30th. Because we're meeting so early this year for the annual business meeting, we don't have the audit done, nor do we know exactly what the budget for the coming year is going to look like because we don't formally have um, notification of how our 12 um, grant proposals were reviewed and whether what was funded and what wasn't. So we actually went back and forth on this and said, should we have a finance report where we say, well, we really don't have anything to tell you, um, or whether we should just 
kind of leave it out and explain to you if the question came up. The reason we don't really have anything to say in terms of a finance report this at this point this year is, quite frankly, the year hasn't been closed out and audited for the preceding year and going forward for the coming year, we don't have a budget, a final budget because we don't know what our grant proposal um, situation is going to be like. But as soon as we know those things, we'll be happy to communicate those to you. Sandy, would you add anything to that or is that an accurate kind of portrayal of where we are? That I think is accurate. Our, our audit is in two weeks, so uh, we're working on that now, the schedule for the audit. Um, and I would just say that the next executive committee meeting, which I'm not sure, but I'm sure, I think we'll have one before the end of the year, they will see the revised budget and the audit report and it'll all be available. And we'll, we'll post when it's ready. Yeah, I anticipate because we've moved the annual business meeting up, normally the time slot that we would have the annual business meeting in either October or November, I think we'll have our first executive committee meeting for the new executive committee, at which point we'll know what the finances are like. We'll vote um, a final budget for this coming year, and then that will be made available to you all. Okay? Any other questions? So with the gamble. Okay. This <laughs> This concludes the annual business meeting for 2016. Thank you for coming.